Thanks so much for uh, putting this together, Michael. This has just been an absolutely, absolutely incredible conference. It's great to see so many people here. Uh, and um, I'm just getting my timer started so I can keep myself accountable. There we go. Um, so thanks again. I'm your friendly neighborhood poster child. And uh, I'm going to talk today about the state of the ACE movement. And to differentiate from some of the other things we've been talking about, the movement I'm talking about is different from the ACE community, which is asexual people, gray ace, demisexuals, and their allies. And it's different from any particular organization like AVEN. The movement is a movement to do two things to, that are very complementary. <laughs> um, the first thing is to create a safe space for ACEs to figure ourselves out. We live in a culture that is um, highly sexualized and that uses a set of language for talking about especially things like identity and relationships and intimacy that aren't intuitive to us. And so there's a, all of us have had the experience of needing a community to understand ourselves and finding one that was really, really helpful. That's the first thing, is creating that safe space. And the second thing is creating open, honest, public dialogue about asexuality, which is very related to what the sex positive movement does, which is creating open, honest dialogue about sexuality. And I want to talk about how we're at a really unique, exciting moment in history right now to do both of those things much more, more powerfully than we have so far. And we're already doing them pretty pretty amazingly if you look at how far we've come in the past 10 years. Uh, and I want to tell you three stories from the past year that illustrate exactly how far we've come. Um, and I think most of you were here this morning to hear uh, Matt, your excellent, excellent talk. Um, to, so you can get a sense of how far we've come since um, just kind of 2000, 2001. Uh, the first story is about where we've come in our partnerships with uh, the LGBTQ movements. Um, so there's, in the U.S., where I'm from, there is this big national conference every year called Creating Change. Creating Change is the place that the national LGBTQ movement gets together. It is where all the political movements and shakers meet. It's where the biggest relationships happen. It's where the biggest policy discussions happen. It's where the biggest um, political strategy kind of minds get together to really all talk. And we've been trying to get a workshop at that conference for the past four years. Every year we'll submit a workshop, and every year they'll reject our workshop. Even though they know that asexuality exists, even though there are organizations that accept us, we just kind of weren't important enough, we weren't high enough on their radar to get accepted into that conference. And this year, because in large part of the documentary that came out, which we'll be seeing later, that changed. And for the first time, there was a conference on asexuality. And we were really excited because we were you know, hoping that we would get some of these kind of strategic thinkers to really think about our movement for the first time. And here's what happened. Uh, to give you an idea, at Creating Change, there are, at any given time, 15 workshops running simultaneously. And average size for those workshops varies usually between 10 and 30 people. Um, we had our uh, documentary shown in a room that was only slightly bigger than this. And we had over 150 people show up. There, um, like, imagine this room with every seat filled, with every, you know, twice, about a half again as long in the back, every standing room on the side and on the back completely filled. They actually had to turn away people for fire reasons. Not too many, thankfully. But there was a huge, huge outpouring of interest. Way more than we expected, way more than the conference organizers expected. There was so much interest that after the movie, we had an impromptu session in the hallway with 40 people which is already more than most conference sessions got, all talking about asexuality. And the reason that there were so many people who came to the movie who want to talk about asexuality is that there have been um, 
campus, in campus LGBT groups and in community centers and in places all over the U.S., and this is mostly the U.S. on campus, places all over the U.S., there have been ACEs coming and asking for support in LGBT spaces, um, and organizers who don't know what to say to them. Because of the visibility work that we're doing, we we're seeing this huge outpouring of people looking for support, not just online, but offline through the movement. And the grassroots of the LGBT movement realizes that and wants resources. And that's why there is this massive, massive outpouring of support. Um, one of the big victories that came from that conference session you were alluding to earlier was our alliance with the Trevor Project. Um, we went out and had lunch after that with organizers from the Treasure Project, Sarah Beth Brooks and I, we talked about the need to integrate asexual resources into the into their hotline, which is a, um, which prevents, like you were saying, self-harm and um, the suicide, self-harm prevention hotline for youth, for especially um, queer and LGBT youth. And uh, the response there was really amazing. They had said that they had had people who were calling in who were looking for these resources. They hadn't known what to um, what to say to them, and thanks to the work that we were doing now, they had a clear message to give. And the really remarkable thing about the Trevor Project is that they actually got a lot of backlash. There's still parts of the LGBT movement that are uncomfortable with us. There are parts of the LGBT movement that um, are so focused on the idea that sex is a thing that needs to get celebrated that they are threatened by the idea of asexuality. They don't fully understand it. Um, and the Trevor Project got all of this email from people asking them to take asexuality off of their resources, and they stood by us. They wrote back, they made a public statement on the website saying, asexuality is a vital part of what we're here to support. It's a vital part of our mission, and we are going to be sticking by this community. So that's my first story. My second story is about the press. Um, a lot of you probably know or have heard about the House episode that came out. Um, and I don't know how many of you know the backstory. So uh, there was a writer on the TV show House, and she had been seeing all of the press that was getting generated about asexuality. And, um, and thought that it was new, that it was fresh, that it was, there was a story there that wasn't getting told. And so she... Uh, wrote this really amazing episode where she did a bunch of research um, and she did a bunch of really good education work on asexuality and she had uh, characters, so there was an asexual co couple that came into the office for something totally unrelated to their asexuality and they happened to offhandedly mention um, to House that they were both asexual and House freaked out and said, there must be a problem, I've got to cure it. And then, this is the original script, uh, and then he went around to all his friends and all his friends were like, dude, it's just asexuality. Look it up on the internet. It's not a big deal. They're totally fine. There's no medical condition to cure. And then House freaked out and tried to cure it. And House was wrong. And the asexual community, the asexual couple, went on with their very asexual lives, and everyone was happy. That was, that was the original episode. And it was a vehicle to do really good education work. And so she took that episode, and she turned it into her editors. And her editors said, this is great, but there's no dramatic tension. There's no point of conflict in this story. So, why don't you have House cure the asexual couple? <laughs> Which is a little far to reach for a point of dramatic conflict, but that's what happened. You have this great, 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 great episode, and at the end, it suddenly completely crashes. And it crashes because, not because these are bigoted, evil people, and Fox, though that happens to <laughs> It crashes because they don't know how to tell a story about us that's interesting. They don't understand what we're struggling with well enough to be able to make a compelling asexual character. And that's why you see so few characters so far who openly identify as asexual, even though there are a number of characters who are very clearly based on asexual people. If you look at, um, uh, is it Benedict Cumberbatch? I kind of Sherlock. Who plays Sherlock? Yeah. Um, uses words from the ace community to describe his character in interviews. 
So it's clear that we're getting researched, but they have, we're not yet to the point where openly asexual characters are getting talked about. And this is going to happen in the next, I would say, two to three years. We're going to have the first round of asexual characters in fiction, and those characters are going to put in place public stereotypes about asexuality that don't exist right now, but that are going to be impossible to remove once they're there. So we're at a moment where we have a unique opportunity to define what those stereotypes will look like. And because, uh, because I'm a poster child and because I'm concerned about this, I got invited to this conference of like media bigwigs in Canada that's put on by this guy named Moses Zeimer, who's like the Ted Turner of Canada. He's this huge media mogul. He started Bravo, the cable channel. He's got all this money. Um, he invited me to go and give a talk about asexuality, and uh, then hobnobbed with all of his media friends. And so I got up, and I gave a talk, uh, which is online, which if you Google David J. Idea City, you'll get a kick out of it. I gave a talk about how um, we live in a culture where the idea of intimacy, the struggle for human connection that all of us share, is really tangled up in sexuality. Sexuality isn't a bad thing, but it's confusing, it's confounding a lot of stuff that's fundamentally not related to it, and that's important to all of our lives. And um, when I gave that talk, when I talked about the asexual community, when I talked about how the perspective that the asexual community has sheds a new light on sexuality and also on how we form relationships, there was a really powerful response from the audience. And all of these people came up to me afterward, especially young people. Um, and it was clear that talking about asexuality had just kind of clicked something in their brain. <clears throat> there was a perspective on sexuality and on intimacy, and on how those things are related, that, they, that they, they'd been struggling with. They, they, the way that those concepts were connected um, hadn't worked for them as sexual people. But talking about asexuality somehow allowed them to think about it more clearly. And this is something, I don't know, for those of you that do visibility work, I don't know if you can relate to what I'm talking about. But there's something that happens when sexual people talk about asexuality that is a little bit transformative and a little bit powerful. And I could see that thing going on. And other people, the media people at that conference, could see that thing going on. And they were like, this is interesting. So, I went up to the uh, Ted Turner of Canada, this huge media mogul, who was observing all of this and like stroking his little beard. <laughs> and I said, um, I, I told him what I just told you. We're at this place as a community where the first asexual characters are going to be coming out. And where we get to determine what the stereotypes about asexuality are going to be. This is the place that the gay rights movement an opportunity the gay rights movement never got, an opportunity the trans rights movement never got. And I was like, who do we talk to? How, what do we get? What do we do to make sure that we capitalize on this moment as effectively as we can? And what he said was, he said, you've got this online community with what, like 50, 60,000 people in it. You need to start telling stories. You need to start telling stories and you need to start looking at the stories that are already being told and organizing them and making it accessible to people who create culture, to the kind of internet in general, so that people understand what you're struggling with. People understand why asexual characters are compelling. And that nugget, that moment of transformation that happens when asexual people learn about asexuality, if you can begin to encapsulate that in stories about yourselves, then you'll have stories that are accurate that are really deeply compelling for the media, because what the press is looking for, both the, the kind of news press and the press, the, the, the fiction, TVs and movies, what they're looking for is something fresh that makes people think in a new way. Not think too much, but think enough. <laughs> and that's something that you all can provide. That's my second story. Um, my third story is about San Francisco Pride. So every year for San Francisco Pride, we have a barbecue in my backyard. 
and we have something that's much less well organized than this. Um, we have a little unconference where people suggest topics and then we have little breakout discussion groups. Um, and this year, the discussion groups were all about two things. They were about the way that we form relationships. There was a discussion group on touch, there was a discussion group on consent, um, and they were about the diversity within our community. There was a discussion group on asexuality and race, there was a discussion group on asexuality and ability, there was a discussion group on asexuality and mental health and how we're engaging the mental health profession, and how we, how we internally as a movement talk about mental health. And what really struck me is that we are beginning to move, a lot of our community, I think this has been going on for several years, a lot of our community is beginning to move to a much more sophisticated discussion about asexuality than has been happening historically. Historically, we've talked about identity. We've talked about understanding ourselves, and that's, that's baked into the mission of what we're here to do. And I think that we're getting to the point where we are interested not only in understanding ourselves, but in understanding the massive axes of diversity that exist within our community, and in finding ways to bridge those. Because if we can begin to draw connections across different language communities, which is part of why I'm so excited about the work that you've been doing, if we can draw connections across different language communities, if we can draw out, exper draw out experiences of um, that really highlight the intersections of asexuality and gender, of asexuality and neurodiversity, of asexual, of, um, that really get into the different elements of romantic and aromantic experience, of romantic and aromantic experience in the gray egg community, then that's where we'll be able to find the kinds of stories that have the transformative power that I'm talking about. It's only by really embracing and engaging with our own diversity as a community that we'll be able to do that. Because there's a particular kind of story that we've been telling, and it's my story, and it's not enough. There are a lot of stories out there that we need to be telling that we're not because they don't happen to be my story. They don't happen to be the stories of people that, uh, many other people in the media team that look and behave like me, and I think that's because our internal ability to share those stories and connect them and bring them to the top is still getting developed. So, what's the state of our movement? I think we're in a place where the broader social discourse about sexuality is on the verge of being disrupted, somehow. It's on the verge of being disrupted because sexual people are not happy with the language they're using to describe their own sexuality. They're not, it, sexual people are not happy with the concept of dating, with that as a ritual for connecting with one another in terms of sexuality or in terms of intimacy. They are not happy with a lot of the categories and the, the way that sexual orientation is talked about in really mainstream, especially mainstream LGBT. LGBT discourse as a label, as an identity. And I think that part of why we've been getting so much attention from the LGB, LGBTQ movement, and increasingly from the LGB, the mainstream LGB movement, and part of why we've been getting so much attention from the press, has to do with the fact that they see us as a new frontier of that discourse. Of a discourse that isn't just important to us, but is important to a broader social discussion about sexuality. And I think that the way that we participate in that discourse is by doing three things. First of all, we need to build our own internal cohesion. We need to build connections across the cultural gaps that still exist in our community, across gaps of language. Um, we need to look for points of intersection and really explore them. Uh, especially intersection points of intersection around gender, where there's a hugely disproportionate, um, there's a uh, hugely disproportionate number of ace people who identify as trans and trans people who identify as ace. Points of intersection around um, language, points of intersection around age. We're still a very young movement 
And I think that that's in large part because that's the only kind of story, the only kind of support that we've learned how to offer. So really pushing those boundaries is going to be hugely important to being able to tell the range of stories that we need to be able to tell to create a broader social transformation. So building your own internal cohesion. The second one is building partnerships. We're to the point now where finally the LGBT movement and the mainstream L uh, LGBTQ movement, um, and especially the mainstream LGB movement, are coming to us looking to partner with us. And that means that if we can offer them resources, if we can offer them attention, if we can have people who are reaching out to those institutions, then asexuality and grace experience and demi experience are going to get incorporated into all of the education work that that movement is doing. And that is huge. That is going to hugely, hugely amplify all of the work that we've been doing around visibility so far. So the second thing we need to be doing is really taking advantage of the opportunity for partnerships that we have right now. And the third thing we need to be doing is telling our stories. This is already happening in Dapper Aces and Hot Pieces of Ace and all of our Avon and all the blogs that are happening. It's already happening in really exciting, you know, mounting waves of Ace fan fiction that are out there. <laughs> I might know I was talking with someone today who is a writer who's going to be working on Ace characters. But um, telling our stories and making it so that people from a wide range of cultural backgrounds and a wide range of personal life experience can find, can see stories of asexual people and graces and demis who, that they recognize, who resonate with them. That is going to really determine what place our community has in a broader social discourse about sexuality. So, to, wrap, to kind of conclude, to wrap up, what I am calling on all of you to do is to connect with one another in this room and to look at the ACE community online, which has become huge and multi you know, with this massive ecosystem, and look for the gaps in that ecosystem and form connections to close them. That's going to be powerful, that's going to be transformative, and it's going to have a really big impact on where the movement goes. So find, find connections, especially ones that close the gaps. Look to build partnerships, even if it's as simple as a partnership with your campus LGBT community, or a partnership, or attending an event that is getting put on in your area and talking about asexuality where it's not getting talked about with an organization that should be incorporating us. But building those partnerships is going to lay groundwork that is massively, massively important. And then finally, work on telling stories. If we can generate content in as many different avenues as we can, if we can tell personal stories, then that's something that I believe will not only make our lives easier, not only make asexuality something that is talked about and respected in broader social discourse, but I think it will have because of, because of that click, because of that thing that happens in people's heads, sexual people's heads, when they hear about and really understand ace experience, I think it will transform, it, it will have the potential to, to push a transformation of how sexuality is talked about in our culture. It will help to disentangle things like intimacy and adulthood and humanity that right now are caught up in a culture of sexuality. And that will have a really positive impact, I think, on sexual people's lives, on the way that we talk about sexuality politically, um, and especially on our community. Uh, so, with that, um, I have an extra, gave myself an extra five minutes by talking quickly. <laughs> and what I'm gonna do with my five minutes is ask you each to think about those three things. Connecting within the community, forming partnerships with allies, and telling our stories. 
And I want you to think about which of those three things is most personally compelling for you to do. You don't have, you're not committing to doing, any, doing anything, but just think about which one of those resonates the most with you and the kind of work that you like to do. And then I want you to turn to the person next to you. And if we have groups of three, that's fine. <laughs> form, form groups of two or three, however it's convenient, and spend four minutes and 34 seconds talking about it. And then we'll go to Q&A. Okay. <laughs> Then we're going to come back together. Oh, that was great. You all great. So we're going to come back together, and I want to answer any questions that people have, or if something came up in your discussions that you're super excited about that you want to share and you feel like doing it in about 30 seconds or less, then you're welcome to do that too. Um, I'll go for the one about, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned this thing about clicking something in several people's brains, um, and I was thinking, like, there was a discussion about, uh, I had yesterday, about assumptions that they'll make, so if they disabled people, they'll kind of assume that they are they're asexual, or they're, okay, basically, if they don't want to have sex with them, then probably they don't, obviously they don't want to have sex with anyone else either. So, and, and sort of the technique, so you can look at them. So you, you know, you're looking at that disabled person, you're assuming they're asexual. Mm -hmm. um, and then you're looking at me, because I'm very good looking. Um, <laughs> <laughs> very good looking. <laughs> so you're assuming that I do want to assess. Mm -hmm. So it's got to be one of the techniques that we, or like, what techniques can you use to kind of make that switch in people's brain? Like, make, like say, bring something that there's a subconscious assumption in their head and bring it to the surface so they actually have to think about it. Mm -hmm. What techniques can we use this with? Uh, to, to make that switch. Um, so the technique, the techniques that I use the most, um, which are not always effective, and they um, also have elements of them that are problematic, um, but the one that I use the most uh, assumes that what's going on in people's heads is that they are equating sexuality and connection, period. So if they look at someone and they say, this person seems capable of proactively connecting with others, then they see that as sexuality. If they look at someone and they, and they say, this person does not seem capable of proactively connecting with others, then they see that as a lack of sexuality. So people will assume that there's a lack of sexuality in children, in people who are, in elderly people, in people that they, they see as less proactive. And um, if, if I can tell them a story that disconnects um, that, that disentangles the notion of connection and intimacy from the notion of sexuality that will create that, that click. Yeah. Um, where they'll be able to suddenly, like before they, you know, they talked about intimacy or connection, like sexuality kind of got dragged along. Um, but have you got like a one chip, like say? Yeah, so, so the thing I'll do is I'll tell a story about um, aces being able to form intimate relationships. And if I tell a story about myself and other people in this community who look like we're capable of forming sexual relationships, forming really close relationships that don't involve sexuality, and, valu va um, and valuing intimacy that doesn't involve sexuality, and valuing it as much as sexual people value sexual intimacy, and I talk about the language that we use to do that, then they'll suddenly have this image in their mind of intimacy that exists without sexuality. And something about that makes it much easier to accept us, and I think also becomes useful in their own thought process. Because a lot of times they can't think about intimacy without sexuality um, before engaging in that discussion. Uh, yeah, great. Uh, just quick. Um, I just want to say what you, were, what you were saying there originally, this, this um, concept of how you can, you can be something people expect to be sexual and use that to turn that around. That's the model that the community has, has had for the, the last you know, eight, eight or so years. Um, and that's, that's recently received quite a lot of critique, this mm -hmm. concept of the gold star asexual, how everybody has to be asexual in a way that can't be invalidated. And then you know, people can say to you, you know, if you're, you, people go, well, you're just ugly anyway, so, or, or oh, you're just transgender, or oh, you're disabled anyway, that sort of thing. And I, I think what's important now is for us to kind of Start seeing asexuality as more of a kind of intersectional uh, thing, which is a 
uh, an academic term I'm aware, which I'll now define, <laughs> which is, you know, that you can't take it in part, that we are all asexual in a very personal way, and we're all asexual in a very different way. And I think that, as I did earlier when answering a question, you can, people who are disabled, people who, are, who have, who are in these intersection, intersectional um, identities, can actually give unique perspectives that are different from what we've had all along. So I can say, you know, people, for example, um, who have hormonal issues, we have constantly been dealing with people saying, well, you have hormonal issues, this is the thing. We have people in our community who have, who have hormonal issues and then have had those issues treated and have been given high levels of hormones. We can talk about the differences, the same with trans people as I did earlier. We can turn around these sorts of things that we've previously kind of tried to keep in the closet, put behind the curtain and just show DJ. Yeah, talk about how to um, talk about that, how to make it about them and what, and what their assumptions are, but I'm going to be about you. Yeah, nobody needs to think, well, I can't talk about sexuality because people will think, oh, that's, well, you're just disabled, but you're just sat there. But everybody has their own, if we're all sharing our perspectives, we're, we're showing a diversity of experience, <coughs> and we all have unique perspectives on, on this sort of thing. We are a big, diverse community. We're actually a really wide umbrella term that covers all sorts of different things. And I think it's really important for us to kind of recognise how we are unique, what our unique experience is, and, and find how we can talk about sexuality in ways that make, that, that are, that are the opposite of the gold star asexual, but are just as difficult to invalidate, because you are giving these unique perspectives. I've given mine, and I'm sure that many people in this room will have similar. Thank you very much. Yeah, I agree. And, I, and that's an excellent example of why having internal diversity within our community and talking about that language stories is so important. Before I get on my question, I so much. I um, there was this once. There, I think it was about a year or two ago now. There's this post that was linked to on somewhere. It's originally posted on the disability blog, and it was this uh, this woman, and uh, she was talking about the intersectional uh, intersectional aspects of being asexual and disabled, and how she got a lot of flack from some people in the asexual community saying, "Oh yeah, you're just you know perpetuating the stereotype and this, that, and the other." But she also got a lot of flack from the disabled community saying, "Oh yes, you just you, you know." perpetuating the stereotypes, so she's stuck in this middle of those two things, then it's a rather hard time for her. My actual question, however, is I remember reading an interview with Stephen Moffat some time back, because uh, a lot of people um, read Sherlock Holmes in his incarnation, uh, not all of them, but the BBC version, as um, asexual of one romantic orientation or the other. And uh, he, some of people have used the term asexual to describe him, sometimes they don't. But Stephen Moffat once said, oh, well, you know, that's not an interesting story enough, so therefore. Uh, and um, he, he got a fair bit of fuck of it. I'm just, I mean, I know there's options to tell our own stories, but how do we do that? Is it fictional stories? Is it um, uh, real life stories? Do we some sort of create an anthology somehow and publish it or what? <laughs> Any ideas? Uh, so I think that um, I think that they can be fictional stories. I think that they can be true stories. I think they need to be personal stories. I think that the the thing that's going on there, but it's not an interesting storyline, is that the experiences that an ace person is struggling with, the 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 kind of ten point of tension in our personal stories, isn't something that the people who are writing mainstream fiction understand well enough to write into the characters right now. I think that they're dancing around a little bit. I think that they're beginning to get there. But it's going to take us articulating those stories um, and making them accessible. So that involves both a lot, involves a lot of people creating stories, fiction and nonfiction. It involves people looking at all those stories and curating and finding the ones that are kind of stand out or that are most powerful and putting them in some polished format so that someone who is looking for interesting stories about asexual people has a place to go and read a bunch of them. Um, and I think that that, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say, there, there's this New Zealand soap opera called Shortland Street, mm -hmm. which um, even though most people over here will have never heard of, most, a lot of very few asexuals around the world have, because one of their characters, or something, Gerald Tippett, I think it is, is in fact asexual, and it's apparently treated with as much respect as a soap opera is capable of treating anything. <laughs> um, so, we, we, and there was a US show called Big that was cancelled after yeah. a season. Yeah. There was an asexual in there. Those are the only two confirmed asexual characters in media in the world that I know of. Yeah. 
I hope people speak to them in the book, but... Yeah, I want to get more questions. Huge. Yeah. Hello. Uh, okay, about the uh, third option, about uh, writing our own stories. Why don't we do a chicken soup type thing? Have a call in for all these stories. Have them edited by our own team of writers and then publish them. We can even self-publish them on Kindle. Mm. I think that's a great idea. I'm going to make anyone who likes that idea talk to you. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm in a, a very rare position. I'm uh, the chair of a transport group and co-chair of a bicycle group in Brighton. I've also got the, um, the ear of the local council, which is the first green council in this country, and uh, also particularly with the equalities department. Now, if I feel up to it, and I have a mild form of ME, I could try and push something through Brighton Council, which at the moment are doing the trans scrutiny, which is something that's never ever been done to make sure that the council policies are suitable for trans people, I can foresee a time when that might be possible for asexual people. I'm not going to be able to do it myself or alone, but I have the contacts there. So if anybody would like to help me, I can do it. and it was obviously some sort of attempt to be like, oh yeah, asexuality is so pure and innocent, like, isn't it beautiful? And they were both lock looking off into the distance and they looked completely bored with themselves. <laughs> it wasn't very good. So I think if, if we do do an anthology, we've got to be really careful about the cover and what sort of message we're putting out. <laughs> Hey, I just wanted to comment on something similar to what Neff was saying, which was that, I, BJ, I think you'd agree with this based on what you were saying earlier, which is that the media kind of gets stuck in this closed loop where they've seen white, cis people in couples usually, and so that's sort of who they seek out in the future. So um, I was wondering if you had any ideas for like how to push forward the stories of people who have not been as uh, prominent in um, media in the past. Uh, so I'll just, so we keep the mic out there, I'll just answer it by speaking loudly. Can you all hear me? Yeah. All right. Um, so we've had some success in that, especially when I'm getting articles around gray A people and gender neutral people, um, where when I talk to reporters, I will um, kind of mention stories of intersectionality in our community, in our community to see if any of them bite. Um, I think if we were to have more people on the media team who had stories that, um, more people on the, on the media team, in the, especially in the UK and the US, who are getting most of our stories right now, most, most of our attention, and in Canada, um, 
then we would be able to uh, we'd be able to direct reporters so that they would get that story even if it wasn't what they were looking for. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it is about having a story that can get articulated in sound bites in a way that reporters can fit into into a story about your sexuality. But I think that a lot of that's about when reporters come to us, they because of the head clicky thing, they are like intrigued about any sexuality, but they don't know what the story is. They're waiting for us to hand it to them. And if we hand them a really compelling story, then that's what they'll write. So if, if, I think it's, it's more about our ability to present that story um, than it is uh, our ability to, than it is re reporters explicitly looking for it. Thank you. I just wanted to suggest that um, when I get, probably in the front of tonight, but tomorrow morning, I should be writing an email to whoever it is at asexuality.org um, just setting out what I would like to contribute or what I can, you know, here's my email, so this is what I can do. And I'm just wondering if, if we all do that, then we would have created the bonds that David was talking about a little bit earlier on. I, I would encourage you to do that. I'd also encourage you to find people here who you can form email addresses because the best way that organization happens is when it clusters up. Is, is when we can have people clustering around projects at conferences like this, rather than all going through the project team. But definitely, if you want to get involved, if you're excited, email the project team, and they'll get right back to you. I, um, on a similar thing, I've just got elected to the NUS LGBT committee. First day, six um, So, if anyone wants anything studenty, come, come to me and do things. <laughs> uh, if we can take one more, and then I want to wrap up. Um, is this, I think the very first question was, how do you um, get people to see the difference between um, sexuality and intimacy? But um, I know several people, certainly as a student, who are very sort of, when you explain it to them, they're perfectly happy with it, but their response is almost always, how can you not want it? How do you sort of get them to see? Because that's that's a ve that's sort of almost that's a very deep seated thing in society, and you could argue evolutionarily of sex is good, and yes, it is. But how do you get some people to understand it's not as important to other people? Because that's sort of the hardest thing I find at the moment. So, uh, uh, to answer that, and also to touch on the the points from the earlier discussion, I think the biggest, most important thing is to talk about what we do want and to hold sexuality up next to that. So for me, I talk about desiring mostly a romantic connection and some romantic connection. And I talk about the, the, you know, kind of the struggle that I have and the successes that I've had in finding that as an asexual person. There's other people who desire very different things who are going to talk about those things that they want and the struggles to get them. But I think that being able to talk about something we want that most people associate with sexuality but that isn't associated with sexuality for us and holding that up next to sexuality to establish the difference is the key to getting past what you're talking about. Because when people say, how can you not want it? It is much bigger than specific acts of sex. And even sort of sexual touch in general. It, it, it's sort of this very wide encompassing thing about connecting with oneself and connecting with other people and manifesting a sense of self-worth. 90% of which isn't actually about sex and is still there for us. And if we can point that out to them, then I think we've created the change we want to create. And that's